Throughout the Middle Ages, castles protect the lands of Europe, lands contested as far back as human memory serves. Built by the sweat of men, these towering fortresses with their enormous barbicans, levels of battlements, and dark dungeons strike fear in the heart of savage invaders. Forstenstein's infamous Black Tower holds the secrets of those who die deep within its horrific pit. Vigersborn, the castle of kings, finds itself engulfed in an hysterical hunt for witches. Odeskalki wards off both Rome and Naples as its mercenary warlords fight for the highest bidder. Montreuil Belay terrorizes the Toué River Valley until use of an ancient weapon crushes its massive barricades. Find out their hidden stories on Secrets of the Castles of Fear. With no natural barriers, Eastern Austria is subject to ten centuries of invasions. Throughout the Middle Ages, the region must rely on man-made structures to protect its vulnerable eastern border. Here, noblemen, farmers and peasants build strongholds to repel the invaders sweeping west across the vast plains of Hungary. The area they defend will be known as Burgenland, land of the castles. The earliest stories begin in the 5th century, when Attila and his Huns ravage the land. According to legend, the barbaric invader builds a lookout on the ruins of a Roman watchtower. Almost a thousand years later, these same stones will form the base of the Black Tower of the Castle of Fear, Forstenstein. Ironically, the Black Tower as seen today is white, its dark stones plastered over in the 19th century. The first castle of recorded history belongs to the Counts of Mattersdorf. Although the exact location of their fortress castle is no longer known, the Black Tower stood outside its walls. In the 14th century, Albrecht, the Habsburg ruler of Austria, orders the first fortress at Forstenstein demolished. After swearing allegiance to the king, the Mattersdorfs are allowed to build again. Their new castle is bigger, stronger, and more impressive than the one they lost. Now the Black Tower rises out of the center of Forstenstein. It is 50 feet wide, with walls 23 feet thick. From its depths comes tales of grim torture and death. The most infamous ruler is a woman. Her name is Rosalia, the cruel and heartless wife of Geletus of Forstenstein. When her husband is called to fight against the Turks, his authority falls into Rosalia's iron fist. Rosalia rules without mercy condemning those who offend her into the 40-foot pit of the Black Tower. Once lowered down into the pit of oblivion, her victims die slowly of cold and thirst, starvation and despair. <coughs> to the relief of his tormented peasants, Galetus finally returns home. He publicly tells his subjects of an evil queen he met during the war. Then he asks Rosalia, what would you do with a queen like that? Thinking her husband is ignorant of her cruelty, Rosalia responds, I would sentence her to die in the pit of oblivion. You have just spoken your own fate, the just man replies. Rosalia is forcibly led to the Black Tower. The guards suspend her from a beam and then lower her until she dangles over the rotting corpses. Rosalia, like her many victims, will die a tortuous, lingering death. The tower guards taunt their former mistress by calling out her name, 
Her anguished pleas for mercy grow fainter and fainter. After seven days, her cries stop. The last guard to call out Rosalia hears only his own echo. There are claims that after her death, Rosalia's ghost circled the Black Tower. To quiet her restless spirit, Galetus erects a chapel on the hill overlooking Forstenstein. Then two legends blend into one as Rosalia turns into a saint, and the mountains that surround the Castle of Fear take on her name. But in truth, the mountains are named for another Rosalia, a 12th century holy woman. This Rosalia is rumored to have interceded with God on behalf of the sick during times of plague. However, the stories of the Pit of Oblivion are real. Throughout the Middle Ages, criminals spend their last days at the bottom of the four-story Chamber of Death. Many will lose their sanity before they die among the rotting corpses. Their names and faces are quickly forgotten. Even the extensive records of Forstenstein do not mention these dead. Only the money spent on the ropes used to lower the condemned into the pit are neatly recorded. By the 17th century, the Habsburg dynasty has ruled Austria for 500 years. Now, the eastern line of castles must fight off Ottoman Turks, who are pushing west from Hungary. The great fortress of Forstenstein strikes terror into the hearts of the invaders. Massive in size, towering over the vast plains, the Turks will never successfully conquer the Castle of Fear. But others are not so content with the Habsburg rule. Hungarian aristocrats join forces with the Turkish Sultan, hoping to form an independent kingdom. But one minor nobleman sides with Austria. He is Nicholas Esterhazy, and for his loyalty, the Habsburgs reward him with the great castle of Forstenstein. From his early beginnings as a noble peasant, Nicholas Esterhazy feeds his ambition with a series of marriages to rich widows. These wives bring with them enormous tracts of land in Hungary and Austria. With his wealth, Nicholas renovates Forstenstein, turning it from a dank medieval fortress into a military stronghold. Only the infamous Black Tower is left untouched. Esterhazy's preparations are essentially defensive, the Turkish invaders continue to raid the villages and farms at will. It will be years before these barbarians are pushed out of Eastern Europe. Only the Castle of Fear will stand strong against total capitulation. To protect their farmers, Forstenstein offers shelter to those who live beneath its shadow. As many as 4,000 peasants pour into the castle during times of attack. Their animals are pastured in the Habsburg within view of the tower. It is told that one night farmers hiding in Forstenstein see a bold band of Turks stealing their cows. No longer will the outraged peasants quiver in fear. They leave their safe refuge and furiously slaughter the relentless invaders. During Esterhazy's time, his army will drive back the Turks, only to see them return again and again. To withstand these raids, he devises a new plan to strengthen Forstenstein. Under his rule, the great well of Forstenstein is dug by Turkish prisoners. It is an astounding 469 feet deep. The well provides enough water for the Castle of Fear to survive the long sieges of medieval warfare. Prisoners of war man the large treadmill that pulls up buckets of water. Walking the wheel throughout the long days, the captive men maintain a steady supply for the castle. Perhaps an easier life than that handed to earlier prisoners who were forced to cut the well out of bedrock stone.
Still, the Turks look to breach Forstenstein. If they are feeling confident, they might dispatch small forces to approach the castle. Some might enter the moat, perhaps to plant a fire mine beneath the castle. A good idea, except that their every move will be seen from the castle platform. Certainly, they can never get inside the castle's front door. A drawbridge will abruptly put an end to enemy advancement. Other infantrymen may have tried less obvious approaches, such as attempting to scale the outer walls. Not a cautious move, for in these days there are no trees surrounding the castle, and the steep rock and exposure will turn any invasion into a mission of suicide. When Nicholas dies, his son Paul turns Forstenstein into a great military fortress. Here, the Esterhazys serve Austria by maintaining regiments of five to 8,000 men. These troops stand at the ready, available to defend the Emperor and the Habsburg Empire at all times. The soldiers of the Castle of Fear march under the orders of the Imperial generals. In the vaults of Forstenstein, the arsenal contains thousands of guns, cannons, cases of ammunition, saddlebags, and suits of armor. This mass of weaponry will increase throughout the years of Christian victories. Paul Esterhazy uses his armies and weapons to attack the ferocious Turks, who constantly threaten the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburg reign. The battles are savage and brutal. The aftermath is worse. Both Turks and Catholics scorch the earth plundering and pillaging all villages and farms in their path. Triumphs are celebrated with rape and torture. By the end of the 17th century, Christian armies drive the Turks out of Austria and most of Hungary. After 15 battles and 50 years of rule, Paul Esterhazy dies in 1713. No other Esterhazy will ever live at Forstenstein. Today, the great castle is open to the public, except for one place that remains off-limits, the treasure room. Last remaining descendant, the Countess of Esterhazy, forbade entrance to this room under any conditions. So at least one secret of Forstenstein remains untold. Styria lies in southeastern Austria. Caught between the plains of western Hungary and the rising hills of the Alps, this region provides the Ottoman Empire with an open path to western Europe. Without any natural barriers for protection, Styria arms itself with formidable castles. Styria's most important fortress is Rigersburg. This castle of kings rises from the peak of a gigantic volcanic rock. Soaring 482 meters above the land, it towers across the plains to distant Hungary and Slovenia. For the invading Turks of the Middle Ages, Rigersburg belongs to a select group of Christianity's impregnable fortresses. For five grueling centuries, this mighty castle lies in the path of the Turks' relentless drive to Vienna. Although Rigersburg dates back to the 12th century, the most notorious owner inherits the castle from an uncle in 1648. The new owner is Katarina Elizabeth Gala, called Lizzie the Galarin. She will become legendary as Rigersburg's most infamous tyrant. Under her command, Peasants dismantled the castle's old fortress and laid the foundations for new buildings. Rigersburg will soon grow into a stunning edifice of over 100 rooms. The long path to the new castle is cobbled and whitewashed. Trellises are built for grape arbors and flowering vines. With beatings and threats, 
Lizzie the Gallarine forces Styria's farmers to toil on her castle six days a week, ten hours a day, barely allowing them time to feed themselves. Prisoners captured in the Turkish wars fare worse. At gunpoint, 700 hack out moats in the rock below the castle. Punishment under the Gallarine is swift and unpredictable. Crimes such as stealing result in torture by flogging, thumb screws or the wooden arm worn as a sign of guilt. Most dreadful of all, a visit to the Iron Maiden whose sharp blades cut her victims to shreds. Looking up from their labors, the townspeople come to curse the cruel tyrant they call Bad Lizzie. Her fortress is as fierce as she is. On the volcano's face, five stout gates connected by fortified walls guard a road winding a mile to the summit. Horses shod with iron cannot manage the slippery climb to Rikersburg summit. At the foot, riders must change to unshod mounts. Heavy doors and soldiers living inside protect each of the five gatehouses. The fortified barriers are centers of battle. When one is overcome, defenders retreat to higher ground and fire on the attacker's flanks from slits in the walls. Thanks to its network of defenses, Regersburg Castle can make a rare boast. It has never been taken in battle. Inside the final gate, Regersburg's masters provide for escape down a treacherous donkey path along the volcano's western cliff. Between the path's first and second gates, Turkish warriors carved a totem, a Muslim half-moon, a reminder of how close the invaders came. Riggersburg's previous lords added pastures, vineyards, and smokehouses, and they devised a water system to outwit besiegers. Spouts on the roofs channel rain into two courtyards. The water runs through the stone into cavernous rooms below. In these cisterns, the water filters through sand and pebbles, then drains into a well 85 feet deep. The only access to the well is inside the castle's most protected quarter, the ornate central courtyard. Although the castle is well fortified, Lizzie must still repel the Ottoman Turks. By 1664, the widow Gallerin has married Detlof von Kappel, a renowned man-at-arms. Her people hope that this love will blunt the tyrant's cruel edge. However, the Ottoman Empire rallies for a final thrust into Europe. At a mountain pass nearby, von Kappel intends to crush the Turkish assault. As the cannons rage in the distance, 2,000 farmers crowd into Rikersburg's walls. Lady Elizabeth anxiously awaits her husband's return. One hundred thousand Turks sweep over an Austrian army a quarter their size. But nature helps the Christian forces. In a rain-swollen river, the fleeing Turks drown by the thousands. As the storm overtakes the castle, a lone horseman gallops up the whitewash path. The Gallerin hears a fearful omen. The sound of horseshoes clanging against the rock. The soldier has risked a trip up the slippery slope on a horse shod with iron to deliver a devastating message to the Gallerin. 
Her beloved husband is dead. Lady Elizabeth prays in the castle's tiny chapel until her body grows cold and numb. Gallerin emerges from mourning embittered. Her anger falls on St. Martin's Church just below the castle bluff. Its clerics have condemned her abuse of the local farmers. However, the Holy Roman Emperor grants Lady Gala the right to select the priest of Rigersburg. Now there is no one to speak for the people. But in the stillness that follows, hatred grows and will explode once the Galarin is dead. In 1672 at Riegersburg Castle in eastern Austria, a farmer's wife, remembered only as the Dark Lady, makes the long climb up to the castle gate. There she begs for an audience with its master, Count Purgstahl, the local magistrate. The Dark Lady makes a grave accusation. In the woods, not far from the castle, she has seen four women dancing before a bonfire in an orgy of evil, a witch's sabbath. Europe is seized by witch-hunting hysteria. In neighboring southern Germany, in just 20 years, 3,000 women have been burned at the stake. At Riegersburg, Count Purgstahl reluctantly presides over the mounting accusations. In his courtroom, trying and killing witches becomes a grim industry. Clerks keep meticulous records of the testimony in each trial. Accusations of witchcraft are prompted by resentment, jealousies, and spurned loves. Confessions are extracted through torture. The judge pronounces a verdict of guilt by breaking a black stick. In 1675, when hailstorms ruin the local apple and grape harvest, 95 peasants are put on trial for witchcraft. The judge, Count Purgstahl, has no choice but to perform his grim duty. Should he refuse a single case, he will implicate himself and be condemned. One alleged witch is accused of making flowers bloom in the dead of winter. For the judge, the case is an agonizing ordeal. For the accused witch, Katarina Paldorf, is a close personal friend. The malicious accuser, acting out of hatred or envy, gives an hysterical eyewitness account. Bloodied by days of torture, the accused is too weak to offer a defense. Count Purgstahl has no choice but to find his friend, Katarina Paldorf, guilty as charged. The flower witch is beheaded, her body burned, and her execution is only the beginning. In the shadow of Riegersburg Castle, the witch hunt flourishes for nearly a century more. Twenty miles northwest of Rome, Lake Bracciano fills the hollows of two volcanic craters. More than a century before Christ, Romans built an aqueduct to bring Bracciano's water to the capital of Italy. Like the lake, the fortress on its shore is tied to Rome by currents of politics and war. And just as the lake hides a volcano, 
elegant Odescalchi castle masks the violence of its warlords. Originally owned by the Vico family, they lose it in the 15th century to the powerful Orsinis, mercenaries to all who will pay their fee. In the presence of the Pope, Napoleone Orsini is a loyal servant. Away from Rome, he swaggers as the most feared warlord in central Italy. Above Odescalchi's entrance, his warrior spirit speaks in stone. Napoleone Orsini, I repel offenders, I defend the good. The Orsini name comes from the legend that the clan's founder was suckled by a she-bear, or orsa. The Orsini men are famous for their bear-like strength and insatiable greed. Odescalchi's armories hoard the tools of the Orsini trade. Napoleone Orsini hires his militia out to Italy's political giants, the King of Naples and the Catholic Pope. Napoleone exploits his powerful clients for his own profit. For his warfare, he earns their gold and land, but never their trust. In 1470, with his blood wages, Napoleone enlarges the 12th century fort and turns Odescalchi into a showcase of Renaissance splendor. To the west of the old castle, Napoleone adds a more spacious wing. Above, he mounts sentry parapets and heavily arms them. Now each of the castle's six turrets soars higher than a six-story building, above walls ten feet thick. Napoleone digs a garrison for his army of adventurers into the basaltic rock of the castle's foundation. There in bleak tunnels, the Patriarch ransoms his enemies and displays his reputation for terror. Where the castle's old and new wings join, Napoleone forms an unusual triangular enclosure. Sentries patrol walkways above the two-tiered portico of the elegant Renaissance courtyard. Their fine, broad arches and ornate columns embody Italy's fascination with the glory of ancient Rome. In these stately enclosures, Napoleone hopes to cultivate respect from Italy's most powerful families. He achieves higher status when his only son, Virginio, weds the daughter of a prince of Naples. All of Italy toasts the brilliant alliance. Even more than his father, Virginio nurses enormous ambition. In keeping with the Orsini heritage, the son becomes a formidable man-at-arms. In 1463, under Napoleone's command, Virginio fights valiantly beside the Pope's army. Lands taken as reward in these campaigns expand the Orsini territory. Sandwiched between the church's lands and the Naples coast, the Orsinis command the largest region in either state. In 1478, Napoleone and Virginio test their growing power. They condemn Pope Sixtus IV for conspiring to murder a Medici, an Orsini ally. But when the plague sweeps through Rome, the pragmatic Napoleone gives his enemy, Pope Sixtus, refuge at Odescalchi. In 1480, Napoleone Orsini, warlord and patriarch, dies. Virginia now claims his father's title and lands. While the balance of power in Rome shifts unpredictably, Virginio's good fortunes continue to soar. 
Virginia weds his own son to a princess of Naples. Then, in the summer of 1492, Cardinal Borgia brazenly buys the papacy and becomes Pope Alexander VI. Virginio must confront the most treacherous pope in history. A contemporary writes that the new pope is guilty of the most obscene behavior, shamelessness, lying, faithlessness, avarice, and cruelty more than barbaric. Threatened by the increasing power of the Orsini family, the Borgia Pope lashes out at Naples and prepares to crush Virginio. Hungry for Italy's riches, France agrees to help. With an army 30,000 strong, the French king sweeps southward through Florence to claim Naples. This will begin three decades of war. Virginio, the master of turnabout, sends his son to the French king with an astonishing proposal. Virginio's son will aid the invaders. Meanwhile, Virginio himself will stand by the court of Naples. It is a desperate bid by the family for survival. Italy erupts like never before. The Pope sends an army to seize Odescalchi Castle. Even the king of Naples double-crosses Virginio. The master of Odescalchi finds himself on a bridge with both ends set on fire. There is no escape. The Pope's army seizes all Orsini lands in its path and camp at the gates of Odescalchi. Virginio, imprisoned by the King of Naples, lies in chains, tormented by his defeat. Soon he will die from poison, a victim of the treacherous Borgia family. A century later, another Orsini, Paolo, is appointed a duke by Pope Pius IV and as a general leads the papal troops against the Turk invaders. But Paolo is not as successful in conquering his wife, Isabella, as he is in routing the Turks. He designs an ornate room for Isabella in bright red. The ceiling depicts the myth of Psyche, the maiden lover of the god Cupid, Forbidden to look upon Cupid's face, Psyche ignores the warning and causes her lover to vanish. Isabella has many secret affairs and her lovers, too, disappear. It is said that when she is finished with a man, she guides him to a doorway that hides a trapdoor. Her unsuspecting lover falls through a shaft studded with blades, disappearing into the bowels of the castle. Isabella's affairs become infamous and humiliating to Paolo. He grows so monstrously fat that only the strongest horses can bear him. Finally, the Duke can look away no longer. He strangles Isabella in her bed and sets Europe abuzz with Odescalchi's bloody scandal. France's Anjou province in the year 1020. At the meeting place of four ancient trade routes, by a ford in the river Tue, a nobleman warrior builds a stronghold from which to crush his enemies. He is Fulk Nera, burner of monasteries, plunderer of hamlets. For his dark complexion and darker deeds, he earns the name Folk the Black. Before the mysterious Folk vanishes from history, he bloodies the Loire Valley in a campaign of terror. Operating out of 20 forts, he stakes his claim to Anjou province and 
writes the first dark chapter in the history of Montreal. No citadel in the region is as feared or sought after like Montreal, deceivingly referred to as the hill by the river. For tyrants, it is a stronghold. For their enemies, an obsession. During the next three centuries, the castle on the river Toué will be an obstruction to peace in Anjou. Cunning as a snake, greedy as a wolf, ferocious as a lion. Thus the chronicles of Meron describe the castle's next master, Gerald II, fifth lord of Belay. Perhaps folk's darkest deed is to grant Montreux to the savage Belay clan. In two centuries in their hands, it evolves into one of the most ingenious fighting castles of its age. Its master, Giraud, terrorizes the province. A robber baron, Giraud Belay holds Anjou hostage to a spree of kidnapping and blackmail. Like Fouque the Black, his favorite targets are churches and monks. Excommunicated in 1129, he plunders on, undaunted. For two decades, Montreux is Giraud's unbreachable lair, until the summer of 1149. Vowing to end this reign of terror, Anjou's new count, Geoffrey the Handsome, lays siege to the castle. Repelled time and again, his band of nobles probe the stronghold for a flaw in its barricade, but the besiegers find none. The northwest face is doubly guarded by the river Toué and a sheer cliff. Attack here is suicide. Capped with turrets, two great towers rise more than a hundred feet over the river. Giraud's archers firing through arrow slits make the most of its bristling defenses. A moat named the Valley of Judah guards the castle's ramparts, almost ten feet thick. From this wall and the ramparts' crow's nests, archers blunt any assault. The castle appears unconquerable. The main entrance seems to be the Count's only hope, yet Montreux's defenses make it a besieger's nightmare. Mounted knights have no chance of forcing the gates of the massive Barbican, nearly a fortress in itself. Its walls are pitted and bruised by catapults, but no stone can bring them down. The Barbican's half-circle face gives defending archers a 180-degree field of fire, as well as a high platform for catapults. Even if captured, the Barbican cannot be kept its rear face is open, exposed to fire from the castle. And when besiegers storm the Barbican and rush the gate, they fall into a trap. The path to the gate is angled, exposing attackers to more archers on the wall and inside the towers. By some accounts, the siege drags on for over two years. Desperate, Geoffrey builds two high wooden towers, which he mans with arches and wheels up to the ramparts. But here, Giraud's archers and pikemen once again shatter his attack. In frustration, Geoffrey the Handsome abandons the frontal assault. A 
But in an ancient Roman treatise on war, he finds a new tactic. For months, his men have pummeled Montreux with stones fired from their fearsome trebuchet, the Middle Ages' most deadly siege machine. The basis of the catapult is the pendulum arm, set into motion by a counterweight. The rope frees the counterweight, and the pendulum lashes out. A sling attached to the end of the weapon doubles its firing range. Yet under this deadly rain, Montreux remains invincible, owing to the castle's ultimate defense. A network of tunnels leading from its cellar to the town. Through them, Jarreau smuggles in supplies. Finally, Geoffrey the Handsome takes the Roman historian's advice and creates a bomb made of iron and filled with boiling oil. This he launches at the castle's keep. The keep bursts into flames. According to the chronicle of Meron, Geroux and his men emerged from their lair like reptiles. Geoffrey throws them in irons. Then he flattens the castle's main tower, breaking the mighty fortress at last. With the advance of weaponry and the advent of modern warfare, the great medieval castles are no longer powerful enough to offer protection to noblemen or peasants. Today, their battered ruins stand high, overlooking the lands they once ruled. Monuments to a time of savage invasions, barbaric cruelty, and the power of kings.